What is up, everybody? You are in the yard where faith and sports collide. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you, Hakeem. We are happy to be here, too. I'm Marcus Preciado, and we have, once again, our lovely and talented co-host, Jefferson Drexler. How are you doing, Jefferson? I'm doing good, Marcus. How are you doing these days? I'm doing great, man. Super excited for today's show. Hey, before we get started, a couple thank yous once again. First of all, I want to thank you. I want to thank you guys, the listeners, you guys watching right now. Really, really appreciate it. Getting a lot of great feedback from you guys. Keep listening. Great things coming. Keep commenting on all the stuff that you're seeing. We really, really thank you very much. And we also want to say a huge thank you to our partner, the Christian Podcast Central. We're in their studios. They partner with us. And that is a huge, huge blessing. Well, this show, Jefferson, as you know, is pretty simple. It's just you and me talking about sports, highlighting the week of sports, having fun with it. But more importantly, we have special guests on each week. They're going to talk about how faith and sports collide in their world. And let's get into it right now. Jefferson, I'm going to talk about some things that kind of jumped out at me over the last weeks in sports. First of all, the Redskins are a lot better than I thought. What? Yes, they are a lot better than I thought. Something is wrong with you. No, Stephen A. Smith, listen to me before you start insulting me like that. Here is why. The Redskins, who I thought were going to lose every game, they won. They, they dominated. They absolutely destroyed an awesome 0-4 Dolphins team. 17 annihilated because the <laughs> Dolphins don't know how to do a two point conversion. It's a, 17 you learn in flag football. <laughs> what a game, Jefferson. The, the, the Redskins versus the Dolphins. And how fitting that that game would be 17 to 16 and end. Give us a little recap of the ending from your perspective. Oh, it's absolutely ridiculous. It was like, okay, guys, all we got to do is, is uh, you know, get this two point conversion. We'll run it up the gut, or or hey, let's do a uh, a rollout. Let's do a RPO. Let's do something like everybody knows. Wait, no, we're gonna call the absolute worst play call in the world. So we guarantee we don't get that two point conversion because we're tanking for. <laughs> I mean, I don't even know if they need. To be, who are they tanking for really? I, I don't know. Looking at the college quarterbacks, there's at least three or four there waiting. You know, there's there's it's hopeless, Jefferson. There's nothing they can do. Tua is not the answer. The, 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 the Dolphins are an inept franchise. <laughs> They're going to be losing for a long, long time. But congratulations to the Redskins for that, for that hard, hard-fought, victorious effort they had. You know what else? The 49ers are 5-0. and oh, and They're kind of sneaky. That jumped out at me, too. Of course, we're not surprised with the Patriots dominating the way they are, but the 49ers being 5-0 and oh is very sneaky to me. What else jumped out at me, Jefferson, is this. We talked about it earlier in the show, but that the NFL is in a really, really good spot right now with its young quarterbacks. They're set up for success. We've got Kyler Murray. We've got Patrick Mahomes. We've got Deshaun Watt. We've got Lamar Jackson. We've got Sam Darnold that made a valiant comeback this week. I see you giggling over there, and I know why you're giggling. But the young QBs are really set the NFL in a great spot. Why are you giggling when I say Sam Darnold? Well, the whole list, actually. It sounds, quite honestly, and I'm dating myself here, but... It sounds like you're in the end scene of Romper Room. Just like look, Romper, Stomper, Bumper, Boo, show me all the 12-year-old quarterbacks that are playing in our league. The dude comes back from mono. I mean, what's next? We're going to have like a chicken pox party with all these young quarterbacks so they can get their... Remember remember mono, right? When we were like eighth grade when the kids got mono and everybody's like, ooh, somebody's been French kissing, Anna. right? I think I think Sam Donald's mom has now forbidden him to go to the roller skating rink and the arcade with his girlfriend. <laughs> He can no longer go there. No more cards. Because the mom, because that's where everybody got mono when we were kids. Remember, like, some guy was making out with Michelle in the roller skating rink, and now Michelle and Billy are out of school for three weeks, and they both come back super skinny, right? <laughs> the, the, the kissing disease, they called it. So, man, the, the NFL, man, is in a really good spot. Notice I left out a name of young, young QBs when I said there, it was the name of our buddy Baker Mayfield, the Browns quarterback, and this is why I don't think he's in that mix, Jefferson. I don't think he is going to be a great quarterback. I don't think he's a good quarterback, and I don't think the Browns are going to win much, and there was all this preseason hype about the Browns 
Browns, but this is what people forgot about the Browns. They're the Browns. <laughs> right? So it doesn't matter about Baker. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, matter about Odell. It doesn't, it doesn't matter, matter about Chubb. And here's the deal. Although I don't believe in Baker, but here's the deal. The Browns are so bad because of the ownership. They will not win with that ownership. They have been bad for so long. And think of the talent that they have. They've got amazing group of talent and everybody. It made sense why they were excited about them. But I didn't fall for it because it's the same dag burn ownership. It's the same inept ownership. It's the same Browns year after year. It doesn't matter who's on the field. They will not be good until they change ownerships a la Clippers. Clippers. The Clippers for so long were so bad. But until they got new ownership, that's why the Clippers are now relevant. That's why the Clippers are now winning. That's why the Clippers will go to the playoffs. It's because of ownership. So Baker Mayfield or whomever they have back there, the Browns won't be good because they are the Browns. College football-wise, you know, Georgia beating South Carolina jumped out at me. And college football-wise, the same old story with Boise State. What are your thoughts on Boise State and them being 6-0 and once again, Jefferson. I'll be real honest, I tuned into the Boise State game. I, I saw it on the on the player guide or on the television guide, popped that in. I called my sons in and said, guys, 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 come look at this. Look at this. Look at the stadium. That lasted maybe 15 seconds. Hey, it's blue. <laughs> and then they do they do have the blue stadium. They got that going for them. But you know what? Uh, people want to get excited about them being 6-0, and oh, and really I'm not that excited. Uh, the last thing that jumped out at me, Jefferson, was the baseball is finally here. And it is the playoff season, so baseball is finally worth watching. we got two great series going on. We've got the National versus Cardinals and the Yankees and Astros going on. So that's really, really exciting to me. And now, out of all the things that happened this week in sports, I want to talk about three things that jumped out at me, not in specific order, not in, in, in order of importance, but just three things that jumped out at me that I want to talk about today. You know, number one is this, LSU, who is ranked number two currently, I think they will end up being number one. They had a great 42 to 28 victory over number nine, Florida, and this is the secret sauce of LSU. It's not the athletes. It's not their conference. It's not their fans. Their secret sauce is Coach Ed Ogeron. I think he is the guy that's going to lead them to a national championship. I love that guy. Do you ever watch that guy, Jefferson? Oh, he's one of a kind. I love him. <laughs> you know, he's a great coach, man. And he's a guy that is a guy that played college football. You see guys like that and you want to play for guys like that. I love Ed Ogeron. As a matter of fact, here's a little clip of a, of a recent of a recent uh, press conference he had that gives you a little taste of, of who this guy is. Can you pull that up, please, yeah, Jefferson? Here's coach. here's coach right here. Cool. Another, another great young man from Destrahan, Louisiana. Hold on a second. Hey, guys. Hey. I'm having a press conference, okay? Thank you. <laughs> uh, great young man. Kind of scrimmage. We wanted to get bigger. I'll stop. Hey, stop the balls, stop the drill. I'm having a press conference. Thank you. Man, this guy, I tell you what, I love this coach. And if I had a coach like that, man, I would run through a brick wall for that coach. But but here's here's something subtle about Coach Ed Odron and another reason that I love him. You know, there is a term called doppelganger. Have you heard about that term, Jefferson? Oh, yeah. What oh, is yeah. a doppelganger? Doppelganger, where uh, two guys look identical to one another. Perfect, exactly. Like me and George Clooney. You and George Clooney. Me and Tom Cruise. <laughs> yes. Right? The obvious. But here's the deal. I want to invent a word right now. I want to throw a word into our American lexicon. And the word is vocal ganger. Vocal ganger. Say it with me, vocal ganger. Vocal ganger. A vocal ganger is not somebody that looks like somebody else, but somebody that sounds like somebody else. And and he has a vocal ganger. As I was listening to him speak, I was going, man, he's reminding me of somebody. Now, he reminds me of this guy called Wolfman Jack. For our young listeners, I know I'm going back. I'm going back. Our old people will like this reference, Jefferson. 
in history of broadcasting today. Wolfman Jack. For our young listeners, Wolfman, first of all, Google him. You guys should know Wolfman Jack if you're an American. Wolfman Jack was a pioneer DJ in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and beyond. A crazy DJ, uh, iconic voice, but he is the vocal ganger of Coach Ed Odron. Can you pull up a clip of, of Wolfman Jack for us, please? Oh, yeah, here he is. Here he is. And then I looked one day, I remember I was looking through the New York telephone directory. And uh, I noticed there was no name in there called Wolfman Jack, so that's the name I decided to use. So that's our buddy, Wolfman Jack. If you listen to them side by side, Jefferson, they're very similar. I don't know, I don't believe in reincarnation as a believer. I believe that the man is appointed and woman appointed to die once and then face judgment. I believe that. I believe that when we die, Right. As a believer in Jesus Christ, I will stand before the Lord. And as a believer, I will become. I was going to say become an angel. <laughs> I will become Michael, the archangel. This is why you're not a seminarian. But OK, go ahead. <laughs> I will be in heaven with our Lord Jesus Christ. So I believe I do not believe in reincarnation, but I do kind of believe in maybe vocal reincarnation. Where maybe our spirit doesn't come back, but maybe our voices come back. Can you can you play uh, um, Coach right next to Wolfman Jack, please? And let's listen to the voices. Here they go. Another, another great young man. And then I looked one day, I remember I was looking through the New York telephone directory. From Destra, Louisiana. And uh, I noticed there was no name in there called Wolfman Jack, so that's the name I decided to use. So somehow, Wolfman Jack's <laughs> voice has entered and possessed, perhaps, Coach Ed Odron. And I'll tell you what, man, uh, that coach is awesome. He's going to lead that team to a national championship. And, number two. you know, number two is going to be this. Listen to me real quick. I need to develop this. My concept that I've learned over the weekend or that jumped out at me is that when it comes to winning in football, Jefferson, boring is better. Boring is better. Boring. Boring is better when it comes to winning in football. How's that? Now, I don't mean so much boring teams or boring players or boring coaches. I mean boring pretty much off the field, especially when it comes to quarterbacks. Boring is better. I'm going to give you a list of names. And when I say this name, I want you in your mind to either say boring or exciting. Tom Brady off the field. Great. Russell Wilson. Way boring. Drew Brees. Major boring. Joe Montana. <laughs> as boring as boring could be. <laughs> okay. Bill Belichick. Oh, you don't get any more boring. Okay, listen. These guys off the field, you don't know any drama about them. You don't hear any nonsense about them. Now, listen to these names. Cam Newton. Dresses like my curtains. Okay, absolutely. Curtains. And Baker Mayfield. Uh, we talked about him already. Right. Uh Johnny Manziel. Johnny Football. Johnny Football. <laughs> Jameis Winston. Poor guy. Poor guy. Yes, yes. Okay, Coach Rex Ryan. Drama. You see what I'm saying? Is that boring is better when it comes to football. And that's really jumping out at me. As we see all these exciting people. I remember Michael Vick. He was going to revolutionize football. But And I'm not talking on the field because there are guys who are on the field like Lamar Jackson who are super exciting but boring off the field. In other words, they just handle their business and off the field, they're quiet, there's no drama, and you know what? Boring is better when it comes to winning in football. Absolutely. You know who's missing from that second list of yours? Who's that? I just realized. Two letters. A, B. (laughs) Thank you. That's right. Antonio Brown, right? He falls into the not boring category. Here is number three. Number three. Okay, get ready for ZSPN. You heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. ZSPN. And who is ZSPN? What is ZSPN? ZSPN is Zion. Zion is going to take over ESPN. This is why I saw highlights of his preseason game this weekend. And they were playing against, I have no idea who it was. (laughs) Playing against 
I don't know. You, you know why I don't? I don't know because they didn't even mention them. They didn't even show one highlight. They showed ten highlights, and every one of those highlights were against Zion. Guys, you heard it here first. ZSPN. Let's see if that catches on because he is going to absorb all the media, all the focus of ESPN moving forward. And here is my prediction. Here's what I think is going to happen. He is going to cause the same amount of of attention, of must-watch TV. I remember these guys when I was a kid, whenever these guys were performing, Michael Jordan and Tyson, he's going to cause that amount of wave of attention. What? I, I, that, I, that is blasphemous. Mr. Stephen A. Smith, that okay. is not blasphemous. I tell you what, that he is going to really, really do the same amount of damage, of attention that those guys did, Stephen A. Smith. Something is wrong with you. Listen, quit insulting me, Stephen. This is what I believe. What are your thoughts on that? I'm with Stephen. Uh, what? Okay, here's, here's the key. When we had Jordan or Tyson or LeBron coming up, they would show highlight after highlight after highlight. You know what they showed for Zion? The same stinking dunk over and over again from the reverse angle, from the animated angle, from the underneath angle. I think, first of all, Zion plays where? Yeah, New Orleans. Where? Who from New Orleans? It's it's kind of like the Jesus quote. Has anything ever come? Anything good ever come out of New Orleans or out of a uh, Nazareth? Has anything good ever come out of New Orleans in yeah. the NBA? Yeah, dude, he's going to come in. They're going to show highlight, and that's it. And then he's going to fizzle away, and we'll go back to Los Angeles basketball. Well, we'll see. We'll see. I'm telling you that once he starts playing in regular seasons, that whenever he's playing, you, my friend, are going to go out of your way to watch him. Your friends are. Your son is. I believe your wife's life is going to change. (laughs) And she's going to stop cooking you dinner. And she's going to be in front of the TV watching ZSPN. You heard it here first, guys. Hey, you know what? We were speaking about, you know, the quarterbacks and, and, and boring versus exciting. And I've been thinking about, you know, a common theme we've been talking about here, which is our friend Cam Newton. And Cam, I said it a while ago, I believe that Carolina is better without Cam Newton they were 0-2 to begin the season with him. And with Kyle Allen Jefferson, they are on a four-game winning streak. So Kyle Allen and Cam Newton have inspired me to write a special little song. For those of you in the yard, I put together a special little song for you called, In My Mind, Cam's Gone from Carolina. This is for you, Cam. We're going to miss you. In my mind, Cam's gone from Carolina He's got all the talent But he ain't no Kyle Allen His outfits are superior To his passing ability So Cam's gone from Carolina In my mind (laughs) (laughs) There you have it, man There you have it, in my mind Cam's Gone from Carolina, written by yours truly. Just a little special, a little something special for our viewers there. Poor James Taylor. Poor, you know what? I love me. I love me some James Taylor. Hey, listen up. I went to a James Taylor concert when my wife and I first got married, like about 20 years ago. I'm a big James Taylor fan, and, and I grew up in North Carolina, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and I went there, and it was in Irvine. When you go to a James Taylor concert in Irvine, there, and you're a Latino, there's not that many people that look like you. <laughs> I went there, Jefferson, and I don't know, how did 5,000 people there? And most of them were about 55-year-old, at least guys, white dudes. Can you say white dudes on the air? Yeah. I can say that, right? And so I'm there, and I love it, and I don't have a problem with being amongst all these white dudes. It's great. I love James Taylor. But as I went to, a, to the bathroom, I'm walking and I'm just enjoying the concert and I see this guy that's about six foot three, six foot four black dude. Can I say black dude? You can say that. Okay, good. I saw him. He saw me. It was like a romantic comedy. We saw each other's eyes as we walked by each other, looked at each other, nodded our heads like you two. Yeah, me too, man. And just acknowledge each other as we walked by and it was a special moment in my life. That black dude, wherever you are, man, I miss you. 
and I'm glad you were with me there at that James Taylor concert. He knows who I'm talking about. Now it's time for one of my favorite parts of the show. Here we go, Troy. Come on, yes. Come on. All right, joy and pain. I want to talk about things that brought us joy and pain over the weekend. For me, the joy was Coco Goff. Ladies and gentlemen, Coco Goff is awesome. This young 15-year-old won her first WTA Tour Championship at 15, at 15 years old. Congratulations, Coco. You are inspiring a nation just like you were inspired by the Williams sister. You are awesome. 15. I don't know what you were doing at 15, Jefferson, but I was not winning world championships. I was wearing swatch watches. I was wearing OP corduroy shorts. I had on polo cologne and parachute pants at 15. I wasn't doing what she was doing. No, no. I was more the uh, acid wash jeans and oh. Dracar Noir. Oh, Dracar you were Dracar in two tones. <laughs> you had, yes, I can see that. It was either Dracar or polo, remember? And as long as you had on Dracar or polo and you had on a swatch watch, any combination of a swatch watch, yep, yep. parachute pants, um, Bermuda shorts, Ray Ban sunglasses, Ray Ban sunglasses, the aviators. You could basically have any date for the weekend in seventh or eighth grade as long as you wore some of that stuff, you were good to go. But at 15, man, I'll tell you what, I was not winning world championships. Uh, on a serious note, I want to just share something, an encouragement for our young listeners because we have a y- lot of young listeners and a lot of guys are following us, guys and girls are following us on Instagram about being 15. You know what? You can make a huge impact for the Lord. You know, a lot of times you think you're too young to do something significant. You think you're too young to make an impact. But I tell you what, if this young lady, Coco Goff, can do this, what can you do at your young age? You know, it tells us in 1 Timothy 4.12. You know, I didn't come here to preach to you today. Listen, I didn't come here to preach today, but listen to this. It says this in 1 Timothy 4.12. It says, don't let anyone look down on you because of your young, but set an example for the believers in speech and conduct and love and faith and in purity. And listen up, you guys, young people out there. Stand up for what's right. Don't let your youth be something that keeps you from making an impact on the world, especially for the Lord. My pain is simple, Jefferson. The San Diego, I mean L.A., I mean San Diego, I mean L.A. Chargers (laughs) had great home field disadvantage this weekend as they got their tails whooped by the Steelers. And it is a debacle up there. I believe 80% of the fans that were in L.A. were Steeler fans, and they have invented home field disadvantage. Well, And it's not isolated to this week. I mean, I've been to Chiefs Chargers games, and there were just as many, if not more, guys dressed in red than there were in their little powder blue. It doesn't matter what what team they're playing. In L.A., there's going to be more of that visiting team's fans. And what I'm worried about is what happens when they actually get their real stadium. I mean, they're barely filling some a soccer stadium that seats, what, 28,000? Yeah. I mean, if you put in, say, 10,000 Chargers fans, is, is there going to be 60,000? It's not, it's not going to work, Jefferson. It, it's not going to work. They, this move is going to go down as a disastrous move for that franchise. LA is not going to receive them. They are going to be a failure of a franchise up there. And I hate to say that, and it hurts me because Chargers were my team growing up, but that move is going to prove to be a disastrous move for that franchise. And I don't think they'll ever recover. What's your joy and pain for the weekend? Yeah, you're feeling it. Feeling it. Sunshine. Yeah. What you got? Marcus, mine's real easy. It's real simple. I I'm a huge baseball fan, grew up playing baseball, so here we are with not just playoff baseball, as you mentioned, but overtime playoff baseball. Uh, as we're taping this, it was last night, Carlos Correa came off with an 11th inning walk-off homer over the Yankees to tie up the series. That was awesome. That's the joy, but the pain, we're going to go back in the calendar a little bit to last week with the Dodgers versus the Nationals again, extra innings. 
Man, that eighth inning stretch of Anthony Rendon and Juan Soto homering off of Clayton Kershaw and seeing Clayton and Coach Roberts, the just the dejection, the pain. I, I don't even know what they're feeling today. Did they? If you lose that kind of loss and then go into extra innings and lose from a, a grand slam home run from Howie Kendrick, what do you do with those guys? Yeah. Where can you go to replace that? that, that you have to go to you have to go to church afterwards mm. and get your heart mended and get your life filled with some Jesus after something like that because that hurts. And speaking of filled with Jesus, we've got a great guest coming up here. Calling in is Kasim. Osgood, three-time Pro Bowl NFL specialist is going to be right here in the yard. So stay tuned and you're going to hear a great, great story and find out what he's been up to. Welcome back. You are in the yard with Marcus Preciado. On the line, as promised, we have three-time Pro Bowl NFL receiver and specialist with a budding acting career as well, and also self-proclaimed world's most sexiest man, Kasim Osgood. How are you doing today, brother? I'm oh, doing good, doing good. Marcus, how are you doing? I'm doing great, man. Thanks for having us on the show. Hey, man, I want to get into it right away and kind of talk about your San Diego State days. Uh, being a fellow Aztec myself, um, I really enjoyed seeing you uh, in your college career. I know you split time between San Diego State and Cal Poly. Why don't you take us back kind of to your San Diego State days? Oh, San Diego State was lovely. You know, I actually um, wanted to transfer from uh, Cal Poly because uh, I was doing uh, – doing quite well there but i wanted to go up to a higher division um and see if i could uh sort of compete with the uh the big boys in the division one level so i actually had a chance to go to oregon but september 11th happened so uh. i had to be enrolled by by that day in order for that year to count for eligibility because of the cherry picking clause and um going to um san diego my brother drove me down there and said come check it out and uh coach toner was friends with one of my former coaches in cal poly so he's uh he said if you like the campus and like team then uh your grades are good enough you can come to san diego so and she came down to san diego fell in love with the city instantly and you know history. well as a former Aztec, kasim i just want to say thanks man uh you know your air kind of brought back the glory days for the san diego state aztecs and it was great great seeing you and, and Tell us about leaving state and then going to the NFL and 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 going in as as a kind of a guy that was off the radar and making a huge impact right away. How did that work out for you? Yeah, you know, I'm only having spent one season at San Diego State playing. I was uh, sort of uh, behind the eight ball when it comes to exposure, so I had to really go out there and uh, make a name for myself and uh, sort of come from the bottom of the of the of the pile. Uh, so uh, I was able to sign on with a free agent with the uh, San Diego Chargers, so they would stay in San Diego. And um, Coach Lofton was uh, the one who was uh, recruiting me and saw something in me that um, I would say uh, he was a sort of a uh, to the team. So you know, I decided to uh, stick on with the Chargers. And um, it was a lot of hard work at first, you know, just trying to prove to people that I deserve to be in the NFL, having not been a draft pick. You sure have to work a little harder. Um, you have to be uh, next to perfect. Uh, as we all know, it's sort of next to impossible. <laughs> but uh, just, I just I stuck with uh, my faith and knowing that to achieve uh, a goal that I set out for myself, which was to be in the NFL. And I knew that hard work pays off. And um, it wasn't just anything about talent. It's more so about your, your work ethic, uh, your personality, being able to fit into a system, uh, knowing how to allow humility to – uh, step in front of you and you just gracefully receive any uh, handouts that are given to you. You make the most of your opportunities. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I, I like how you say that because making the transition from D one to, to the pro level, you know, everybody there has talent. And that's one thing that stuck out about you. Cause was your, your work ethic, your, 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 your focus, your drive. And that led you to man, becoming one of the best, if not best special teams player in the NFL. Tell us about during that season of your life, making pro bowls and, and how did that feel being a, you know, some, some kid that, that nobody knew about to now being a pro bowler. Yeah, we had a, um, we had a lot of, uh, 
a, a lot of undrafted free agents that came to the team my year. So uh, myself, Stephen Cooper, um, Antonio Gates, uh, were some of them in a few, uh, Chris Dillman as well. And uh, all these guys made their way into uh, starting roles on the team. Um, there's a lot more uh, free agents that came on board as well that year. But uh, it, it, was, it was slim pickings in order to be able to get a starting position and, you know, outshine some of the uh, draft picks. Because, as you know, there's a scouting department, and they – take pride in their ability to find talent, see talent, and, and, and draft them accordingly. So with all these free agents coming in and, and becoming starters, it kind of throws a monkey wrench in their plan. So, you know, on the political aspect of it, uh, I worked hard in order to uh, get into a starting role and then I had an injury. So um, after I was injured, they had another draft pick in there who's Vince Jackson, and he got into the starting role, and Vince is an awesome player. But uh, once he had an ability to, to shine and make a name for himself, this when I came back from the injury, it sort of, um, you know, had to start from scratch. And – there wasn't a lot of opportunities to get in that receiver, and we had a pretty stacked uh, roster. You have Malcolm Floyd, um, Vince Jackson, Antonio Gates, uh, Ladanian Thomas, and there's a lot of a lot of options uh, on offense. So, to come back from injury and sort of jump in the mix of things and, and try to, to be a, a star receiver was sort of sort of hard. And I didn't, really... but. Um... You know, I have swallowed my pride and understand that there's a position for me on this team. And if I was to uh, humble myself, then I would have a lot of great years of excitement, uh, being a part of the team, being in the NFL, doing what I love. And I decided to make the most of my such teams opportunity because uh, I was uh, also a defensive player in college. So I just had to revert back to my old my old uh, mentality of smash mouth football and uh, remove myself from the graceful, uh, elegant deer-like strides on a wide receiver to – you know, snot coming out of the nose and eyes crossed and ready to hit anybody that moves. <laughs> and, um, I mean, I, I enjoy it. I enjoy contact. I enjoy football, the uh, competitive nature. Uh, special teams is pretty rough work. And uh, I was proud of myself in being a blue-collar worker. And I always knew that I can get out there and I work now, out hustle people. And uh, sort of made my, a name for myself there and, and took pride in doing the dirty work because, you know, at the end of the day, we're all here to have a party. And if you're not hosting the party, then you got to be the janitor. At least you're at the party still. So I didn't mind being the janitor and, and sweeping up uh, the, the party after LT and Sean Merriman and those guys, uh, you know, went out there and did their thing. You know, that that's interesting how you tie in those, those faith elements, Kasim, you know, that these biblical principles work. You know, whether it's as a pastor, as a father, a husband, but an NFL star as well, you know, to be humble and to 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 really let others maybe get the glory allows you to get the glory in the long run by humbling yourself and accepting a role that maybe you could have rejected as a special teamer, but it led to you being a three-time pro bowler. And it's so amazing how biblical principles work out in life. Um, why, don't you, why don't you share with us a little bit where you're up to now? I know you're a, you're a budding professional. I know being the world's sexiest man is a big burden, Kasim, but someone's got to be it. You know what I mean? And if that someone is you, then well, you just got to own it. <laughs> It's very hard to fend off this this the competitor I have. His name is Marcus Preciado. <laughs> He's been the the, the reigning cha- reigning champion, sexiest man for about ten years running now. So hey, that's what I tell my wife every day. So you know, if I tell you enough, maybe she'll believe it. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> how, tell us about your acting career and how that's going. Yeah, I have a movie premiere uh, coming out um, in two weeks, uh, October twenty sixth. We're premiering our our uh, movie. We have a little scary movie coming out called The Psycho's Path, where uh, Rampage Jackson. Uh, former UFC uh, heavyweight champ, light heavyweight yeah. champion, the the serial killer in that movie. So it was a little, little fun, scary movie for the Halloween. Um, I just uh, finished uh, doing a commercial for insurance with uh, Dennis Quaid, also. So oh, wow. pretty out, outstanding individual. He's good, 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 good people. Yeah, you're playing but, um, with the big boys now, man. With with Dennis Quaid and, and cats like that. Yeah, it was. Uh, it, it's it's a hard profession. I'd say it's a little harder than getting into NFL. But um, I decided to play at football first because it's a young man sport. So I wanted to get out there and run around while I was still young. But <laughs> I always knew that acting, acting was another passion that I could get into once I retired from football. So I, I got into football, and I I try at, at most to just play and use the uh, the skills I learned from my uh, classes, the uh, acting classes. So I got there because um, not having the notoriety, like uh, I can't walk in there and say, "Hey, I'm a Danny Thompson. I want to get into a movie." You know, I'm like, hey, I'm Kasim Osgood. And some people are like, oh, yeah, I know who he is. I watch football. Or, yeah, I don't really follow football, so I don't know. you got to use your merit and your talent. And, and the one thing I realized, there are so many people in this market. It's a very, very saturated market. It's very hard to 
to get on. So you have to not only rely on the skills that you've been blessed with, but also it comes with favor. And I always find myself, uh, before I go on auditions, as asking the Lord for favor and uh, granting me grace. So when I go out there, my perform and, and likability is, is one thing that, that I would say that, that really really comes true when it comes to Hollywood, is that you have to have likability. The camera's got to like you, the director's got to like you, the the whole uh, casting director's got to like you. So it's a, a lot of variables in there that you have to really go in on faith, knowing that God prepared you to do it. You have the skills you've been blessed with. Uh, if you have humility, then God will bless you with, with more. So I've been, uh, I've been finding myself staying tuned to the Word and um, understanding that, you know, God gives you direction and he, things that He wants you to do, but then there's things that He doesn't want you to do. So, you know, some of these roles aren't meant for me, and I, I humbly accept that, you know, hey, they didn't pick me for this, and it didn't work out. So I'm, I'm happy to, to get what I receive and also understand that you don't get everything, and don't be mad about not getting everything because mm-hmm. everything's not for you. But yeah. so what is for him is great for him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, tell us about how your faith, Kasim, um, how has it kept you anchored? You shared a little bit about that through a successful professional career and now your acting career. Oh, just being able to reinvent yourself. You know, going from, from your whole life playing football to all of a sudden now the next thing I want to do is get into acting. Mm-hmm. So I, I really picked professions on the planet with so much competition. I always found myself that uh, God's always given me that ability to overcome adversity, um, except when, when you get criticism. In Hollywood, I would say 98% of you're, they don't want you this role, you don't fit this role, you don't fit that role, you get this part. And a lot of times you would you would feel self-defeated or, or you feel like you're lacking something or you know, you feel inadequate, um, self-consciousness comes into play, um, you know, your, your self-esteem may get kicked in the face, but I find if you have grounded yourself in moral principles uh, uh, built on Christ, you know that what you receive is what you've been uh, destined to receive, you know, staying faithful. Uh, it, it's not about whether somebody says yes or no to you. It's about whether or not you're in touch with yourself and knowing that, you know, you come out here to have a good time, and your good time might be, auditioning your good time might be getting a role or you good time might be creating a role if you're a writer or a, a director so for myself i just i use my faith to keep me grounded and knowing that i am who i am i have my identity in christ and i'm here to do a profession which is just the job at the end of the day so when you clock out is there any character left in your in your, in your body that's not tied to your uh, validation from other people hmm. Great, great points. And, and in closing, because what about uh, a young listener? We have a lot of young listeners that are kind of they know who God is, but they think, you know what? I can't. I, 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 I want to pursue football or acting or glory for myself. What would you encourage them to do if they're on the fence about putting Christ first in their lives? What would your encouragement be to them? Uh, I would tell people that uh, something that worked for me that, that my mom told me long ago is that she was not a, a big fan of me playing football. And I just knew that one day, so I mean, started when I was 12 years old, I had that voice in my head that told me, I'm, you're going to play football. To the point where people asked me, like, oh, we're going to play p- pickup ball in the in the yard. You know, uh, who do you want to be? Some people, I want to be Joe Montana. I want to be Jerry Rice. And I always said, I'm going to be Kasim Osgood. Because so it's always been my goal, mm-hmm. and I've always heard that voice. And I've always been close to God ever since I was saved. I was baptized at eight years old. Wow. And I just always known, I've always been very direct in what, what I know. And the voice that tells me something in my head, I do it. And I do it exactly because having that close faith, it allows you to lean on what you know to be correct. So you don't sway when the wind comes, you don't get blown over. You stay firmly grounded in the word that you know that's in your heart. And that word directs your mind so that you know what your destiny is. And people say, I don't believe in destiny, but destiny is just listening to what God already has mapped out for you. Yeah. So if you if you trust in God that he has a plan that, that's exact for you, then it, it takes the stress away of wondering what you should be doing rather than knowing, hey, I hear this voice in my head, God speaking to me, I'm going to do that because I know that he knows better than I do. And I never stepped on that field one day without knowing that without faith, I would not get through it because there's so many variables that could come into play. And when people get injured or the career is short or the politics don't make it out or you get cut from the team, you know, at the end of the day, when you clock out, who are you? And if you're a, if you're a, man, of, a man of God and you have Christ rooted in your, in your heart, then you know that if this isn't meant for you, this door closes, there's another door that's going to open. It's just a matter of whether or not you're in tune to hear him tell you which door to pick. 
Now, you might pick three or four doors that might not be right initially, but eventually you're going to pick that door that God's been telling you, hey, this has been the door the whole time. And when you get there, you're going to have that satisfaction of knowing that you're in congruence with what the Word is saying, with what your actions are. And it, and you definitely notice, you, it's noticeable when God tells you a plan and you see that plan coming and you're acting on, on faith and you can feel that in your heart that, this is meant for me, and this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And that gratitude of knowing that you're obeying God, it shows in the work that you put forth. Kasim, great, great parting words for not only our listeners, but but for me, uh, the people part of this team. Thank you so much for joining us today, man. We look forward to God blessing this new career. You're having a huge impact. Continue to have fun, uh, build that platform, and use it for God's glory. Kasim, thanks so much for joining us in the yard today. I appreciate it, brother. I love you, and we hope to chat with you soon. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I want to say one word to you, Marcus. I, uh, I really appreciate you as a pastor, as a friend, a uh, man of God. You really reinvented yourself. You always have something going on that's creativity. And God has always blessed your ability to create uh, something from scratch, and it becomes beautiful. And everything you do, you, God is the root, uh, fruit of your labor. And I appreciate you as a friend. Man, thank you, man. I look forward to you being part of the yard as God does crazy things with this as well. Once again, I love you. Tell your family I said hi, and we'll chat with you soon, brother. Hey, because it must be in the yard. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Another great time here in the yard. Thanks, Kasim, for joining us. Thank you guys once again for listening. I'm Marcus Preciado, and you are in the yard. Oh.